Okay, folks, let's get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I am Josiah Neely. I'm a senior fellow here with the R Street Institute. And uh, today's event is on FERC's Order 2222. Um, last September, it came out uh, about roles that, uh, you know, re removing barriers for distributed energy generation, and now it's moving through the regulatory and market system. We want to talk about what it is and what it means and what we're likely to see coming down the pipe. Uh, and so to do that, uh, we have uh, a great set of panelists with us. So first in the order, uh, and let me just uh, give you a little bit about the structure of this event. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the panelists. They'll, they're each gonna talk for a little bit uh, about their own subject. And then uh, we're gonna reserve the bulk of the time for audience Q&A. So if you have questions in the course of the presentations or afterwards, uh, you can put those in the chat. Um, so uh, first we're gonna be hearing from uh, Lorenzo Kristoff, who is an energy consultant. Uh, he works to transition the electric power system to integrate high levels of renewable generation and distributed energy resources into the grid. And uh, from 1999 to 2007, he was a principal in market design and infrastructure policy at uh, CAISO, California's ISO, where he was the lead designer for their nodal wholesale market. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Chris Villarreal, <clears throat> who is an associate fellow at R Street, and uh, he has decades of experience in uh, electricity and utility policy, and particularly relevant for today's event is that uh, Chris oversaw the development of uh, NARUCS, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioner, uh, their distributed energy resources rate design and compensation manual. Uh, so he's very familiar with DERs and uh, how they function in the grid. And then uh, finally, we have uh, Caitlin Marcus, who is a director with Advanced Energy Economy, uh, where she leads the regulatory and legislative engagement of the Advanced Energy Buyers Group. And she also works to expand the use of advanced energy and uh, in wholesale markets, a particular focus on ISO New England. So thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to all of you out there for joining us. And with that, I am gonna go turn it over to Lorenzo for his opening remarks. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, um, Josiah, for the introduction. I'm really glad to be part of this conversation. Uh, I wanna just provide a little background really for those who are not completely familiar with the order. I've gone through it a couple of times and, um, and sort of have compiled what I think are highlights. So I'll try to lay out some of these basics so that we have at least a, a common understanding of some of, the prelim, uh, some of the main elements of it. FERC order 2222 issued last September really was the culmination of uh, over four years worth of work in progress. It was initially when the NOPER came out in uh, 2016, it was initially tied to uh, market participation by energy storage and market participation by DER aggregations. They were both in one docket. That got split in 2018 with FERC's issue of order 841 and in which they laid out directions to the ISOs and RTOs uh, about integrating energy storage into their markets. But FERC took more time uh, to gather more information through a technical comment, a technical conference and some rounds of comments before um, issuing the order on DER aggregation, which just came out. The idea being uh, that, and the fundamental motivation was to remove barriers to participation of DER aggregations in capacity, energy, and ancillary service markets operated by our ISOs and RTOs. They define DERs very broadly. Any resources located on the distribution, any subsystem thereof, 
or behind a customer meter. So the, the, the vision is that these could be behind the meter devices, it could be in front of the meter devices, it could be traditional things like demand response and energy efficiency. They really uh, clearly intend to make it a very broad umbrella, what's ever on distribution. The existing barrier that they're specifically concerned about and addressing through aggregation is that if you look at individual DERs, many of them will simply be too small to participate in a wholesale market. They won't meet minimum size requirements, or they might not singly be able to meet performance requirements for market participation. So that's really the very explicit barrier that they're trying to address. Aggregation then would enable uh, groups of DERs to be operated in a coordinated way to meet the minimum size requirements as well as performance. Um, the ISOs and RTOs are directed to establish DER aggregator as a new type of market participant. That's the entity who is participating in the market. And that entity, the aggregator, can create a DER aggregation, which is a specific resource. And that specific resource has a listing of all the component DERs that comprise the resource um, and, and registers at a, as a resource formally and uh, then participates under a participation model, which is a set of participation rules essentially that accommodate the actual physical and operational characteristics of the aggregated resource. There's no opt out allowed by the order, except that they have an exclusion for small utilities. I don't remember what the number is, but a small uh, distribution utility that has below a certain annual number of um, megawatt hours served can opt in, but they're not required to participate. Everyone else above that size threshold is required. And then finally, there's a whole lot of discussion, a major section H of the report, if you're interested, on coordination. The idea being that um, a transaction between a DER aggregation and the ISO market is really a bilateral transaction between those two entities. But physically, there's electrical impact on the distribution grid and the distribution utility is not part of the market transaction. So how do we create coordination framework that would uh, ensure safe, reliable operation, et cetera? Um, so um, one of the things uh, to, to note specifically that, that the order emphasizes in many places is that the primary relationship in this market transaction is between the RTO and the aggregator, not the, I, the RTO and the individual DERs. And so it's very formally uh, stated that the DER aggregator interacts with the, um, the RTO, is responsible to ensure that the aggregation meets the performance requirements. It, the aggregator is the single point of contact uh, with the RTO, and then it's going to receive dispatch instructions for the aggregation and is responsible for passing those on to the component DERs, responsible for <laughs> metering and settling the individual DERs, et cetera. So that's a, a form of, of allocation of responsibility that the order establishes. And in that regard, the order does not specifically exert for jurisdiction over the interconnection of individual DERs. It, uh, it says that um, aggregations should be technology neutral. They, they uh, don't exclude any kinds of um, technologies from participating in an aggregation and that aggregations can be heterogeneous. They can consist of diverse types of DERs that comprise a single aggregation. That was a somewhat controversial point. There were many parties that argued they should be homogeneous. Um, FERC um, argues that, um, well, the functional capability may be diminished if we insist that they all have to be the same type of thing. The diversity is really what can, um, what can add value here. Um, the, um, the ISOs in the technical conference in 2018, the question came up about 
whether an aggregation can span multiple pricing nodes in the ISO's uh, network. Uh, pricing node typically being a single transmission distribution interface where an, a locational price is established. Most of the RTOs said no, that it should all be under a single node. The KISO proposal, which had previously been approved by FERC, allows for multinodal aggregations with the establishment of distribution factors that describe how much of the installed capacity is each node. FERC does not say whether uh, an RTO has to approve multinodal or not, but it says that the aggregation should be as large as technically feasible. And if they're placing technical limits on it, they have to give a technical justification for why that's a problem. They also recognize that DER, a DER aggregation participation may impose costs on the distribution system. That is telemetry, visibility, other kinds of management and coordination activities that may be costly. And therefore it allows for the possibility that the distribution utility can assess a wholesale distribution charge to uh, an aggregator or an aggregation that wants to participate. Um, finally, um, I guess I'll just point out that uh, the section I mentioned earlier about coordination is very extensive and uh, it includes the what they call the relevant electric retail regulatory authority. They got a new acronym RERRA and basically that means that um, since we have to work to figure out coordination between the RTO and the distribution utility and the DER aggregator for safe, reliable operation, coordination of real time, et cetera. We also need to include the regulator of the distribution utility in that conversation optionally. FERC can't order state regulators to participate, but it invites them to, and it directs the ISOs and RTOs to lay out what's the process, what's the provision for how we're going to work together and coordinate. Um, one piece of this coordination that I think is going to be challenging to work out is that um, because the aggregation requires, relies on the distribution system to be able to deliver a response to a dispatch, changes in distribution can impede the capacity of the aggregation. And from what we know and what was talked about in the technical conference about distribution systems, their topology is much more variable than transmission. Lines are taken out of service or are switched to another substation all the time. So things can happen in real time on distribution that may be unplanned and that can affect the ability of an aggregation to respond. So there's a couple of provisions there that one, the aggregator is required to report to the ISO or RTO anytime there's a change in the capacity that it's able to offer that may occur due to changes in distribution system conditions. And the order also provides, uh, I'll point you directly to section paragraph 310 if you want to read about this in detail. Uh, it requires that the tariffs of the RTO and ISO allow for the distribution utility to override an RTO dispatch if they need to override that for the sake of managing reliable operation of the distribution system. Now, FERC also puts in the words, transparent and non-discriminatory protocols and procedures for the utility to override the RTO dispatch. Exactly how that's going to be done remains to be seen. So that I think will be a, a controversial area. Um, and um, finally, if a DER aggregation is not able to comply with a RTO dispatch instruction due to changes in distribution system conditions, it may be subject to non-performance penalties. If the ISO or RTO has such penalties in its tariff, they would apply just as well to a DER aggregation as they would to any other generator on the system. And there are no provisions in the order that says, say, the distribution utility should compensate 
the uh, aggregator, if, if, it's, if it's caused by their own facilities having a D-rate, uh, there's no uh, imposition of liability provisions that the utilities, uh, some of the utilities have been asking for. So this question of exposure to, uh, to fees or penalties um, on the part of a, an aggregation due to changing distribution system conditions, I expect will be a fairly hot topic in the, uh, in the uh, compliance filings. Compliance filings are due on July 19th. So we've just got a little over six months. Uh, and of course, many have been working on all of these uh, uh, already for quite a long time since the order came out. The, um, the, the implementation deadline is not specified. Each RTO and ISO can propose its own reasonable implementation date when it files its, its tariff compliance. And it's, the order excludes from um, consideration uh, issues about, for example, distribution system benefits. Can a DER aggregation provide benefits and also get compensated for service to distribution? Uh, grid modernization issues, um, all of those kinds of things are really out of scope. The order is focusing on participation in the market and the things that are absolutely necessary to enable that. So um, at that point, I will stop and um, hand off to uh, Chris. Okay, and uh, Chris, before uh, you launch into your segment, we did have one person who asked uh, me to say a little bit about what the R Street Institute is, because uh, we may have some people who are not aware. So uh, we are a non-partisan non -partisan research organization. Uh, there are Protestants here, I suppose. Uh, so uh, colloquially speaking, we're a think tank. We work on a bunch of different issues, uh, particularly uh, energy and electricity regulatory focused. Um, we are, our motto is free markets, real solutions. And by that, we mean that, you know, we're generally speaking favorably disposed towards markets. We believe that they have a lot of benefits in all sorts of different contexts, but we also try to be pragmatic and put forward ideas and uh, solutions that are realistic within the framework of the system. So. Uh, with that, now you can go, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Josiah. And, and yeah, the, I guess there are non Protestants at our street, aren't there? Um, so I just wanted to follow up on, on some of the stuff that Lorenzo talked about. Um, I'm focusing on just a, just a handful of the topics. So, um, first and foremost, I just want to note that Order, order 2222, I think, is, is going to be a substantial victory for the role and opportunity for distributed energy resources to participate directly in the wholesale markets and allow those resources to access uh, the additional benefits that they can provide uh, to the system uh, and to the consumer and to society at large. And as with all things like this, the devil remains in the details and the compliance that each of the RTOs around the country are going to follow through on in um, complying with the requirements of, of 2222. And I'll note, as a uh, preliminary remark that the regulators in this case, uh, while the RTOs are responsible to FERC, there is going to be a substantial amount of work that needs to be done at the state level by the state commissions, which I'll get to in a second. So I first want to just um, jump on a couple of things or dig into a couple of things that Lorenzo talked about. Um, the first thing that he, he noted is that FERC requires um, or allows DR aggregators to be composed of multiple types of technologies. So what that means is it allows a, an aggregation to be made up of uh, energy efficiency or solar or storage or electric vehicles uh, as one aggregation. <clears throat> the reason why that is important is, as Lorenzo pointed out, there, there's a number of telemetry requirements that a, a single resource might not be able to provide. But it also allows for these resources um, to work together in ways to, to provide these services directly to, to the wholesale market. So, for example, um, and when aggregated together, these resources would be able to participate and, if technically capable, provide services like ancillary services into a wholesale market. 
The reason why this ends up becoming important is in conversations going on so far in RTOs like at MISO, um, some of the existing programs that MISO has for DER, specifically demand response and storage, are only for demand response and for energy storage. So one of the challenges going to, that's going to take place in some of these RTOs is the development of brand new programs and products that they don't have um, or the, the opportunity for new resources like DER to participate outside of the existing programs that they already have for demand response. And in the MISO's case, demand response is almost entirely an emergency resource. Whereas what 2022 is trying to, to do is allow these resources to be a more active participant for all products that they're technically capable of participating in, including things like and the non-span ancillary services. So that becomes one of the first challenges that um, RTOs may have is looking at their existing programs and figure out where can these new resources participate outside of what they've already done. And in, in the MISO context, uh, that might be a bit of a challenge in thinking about how these resources are new and can participate in things that they haven't participated in before, which, as Lawrence pointed out, is one of the points of lowering barriers to entry. The second topic that Lorenzo pointed out was um, leaving it up to the RTOs to determine whether or not these resources can participate in uh, in aggregation of nodes. And um, reflecting on, the, again, the conversations that I've listened into at, at MISO, um, that discussion often results in some wildly, some wildly, probably unfeasible type of aggregations. Um, for example, there was discussion about can an aggregation be made up of bits and pieces from one service territory and its other service territory uh, that's all within one RTO and be bid in. And I think what needs to happen in these conversations is be a lot more realistic in how DERs and how DER aggregators might actually organize themselves around LMPs within individual service territories themselves. So, for example, um, there is Still, an existing program at, at California ISO where an aggregation of LMPs require themselves to be adjacent to one another. So you can't aggregate a demand response program in PG territory with an energy storage program in Southern California Edison territory. They all have to be located within one uh, geographic region. So I only bring it up because these wild speculations of what multinodal aggregations might look like may end up making this conversation more difficult and more challenging than it really needs to be, not to, not to mention more technologically challenging to implement it as a result. Um, the third thing, and this is really going to get to where the PUC needs to come in, is this t and coordination function. And um, it's really important to ensure that the distribution utility is aware of the aggregations that are participating in wholesale markets because if, if the RTO dispatches, let's say, a combination um, demand, response for a demand response and storage program that's both kind of distribution system, but the distribution utility is unaware of it, that could have significant consequences on the operation of the distribution system and may increase costs substantially at the local level. So how these information flows take place, on one hand, we'll start with the RTO because the RTO needs to understand how it will operate its system. The flip side is the, the, the states will need to develop the policies and the rules to ensure that the DER, DER aggregator is communicating this information back to the distribution utility. That relationship, best I can tell, is fully within the authority of the state commissions. Uh, in addition, FERC Order 22-22 also leaves it to the states uh, and working with the RTOs to determine what are the data requirements that are going to be needed to facilitate and enable this market. So it's a combination of both the telemetry requirements that the DER will have to provide, but also how is customer usage information being shared between the customer, the utility, and the DER? That interaction also is to be left between the states. And again, thinking about where the state role is in all of this, um, especially in the Midwest, that has limited experience with retail choice, 
or figuring out these information flows between non-utility providers, there is a lot of education and work that is gonna to need to take place with the state commissions, um, starting with the RTO process, but then following through on, on, the, to, on the state commission pro, um, proceedings to ensure that the goals of FERC Order 2222 are not at the end hindered by um, difficult or expensive solutions that are not technically necessary to facilitate and enable the, the goals of FERC Order 2222. So while we have a lot of focus going right now at the RTO levels, uh, which is appropriate, all things considered what they're supposed to do, there is still a longer term, um, a set of longer term strategies that are only gonna be left to the states in order to successfully meet the goals and interests of FERC Order 2222 regarding the roles of the utility, the commit, the aggregators and the customer, how those are all supposed to work together, how the distribution system itself can be operated in a way that is that does not harm reliability and increase cost, but at the same time ensuring that barriers at the distribution and the retail level are not erected in such a manner that you in, in essence eliminated all real hope of meeting the goals of FERC Order 2222. So to end this on a positive note, I will again note that this is a tremendous opportunity to allow these resources to participate in wholesale markets and to provide this, the benefits and services that they can provide, uh, both technically as well as policy-based. Um, it just requires and it makes us ensure that we all are working together to um, achieve FERC's vision for the role of distributed energy resources to participate directly in the wholesale markets. And with that, I will hand it over to Caitlin. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, great. Well, um, thanks for having me, Caitlin Marquis from Advanced Energy Economy. And I will start with a brief overview of AWE. Learn from, from our street, slipping that in, both for those of you who um, aren't familiar with us. And I think it's also kind of a helpful um, intro to the context of how we're seeing and thinking about Order 2222. So, Advanced Energy Economy is a national trade association. We um, work on policy issues at the state, regional, and federal level on behalf of our member companies who span the advanced energy industry. So the technologies that we represent include energy efficiency, demand response, energy storage, solar, wind, hydroelectric power, nuclear, electric vehicles, biofuels, and then all the enabling technology and software um, that uh, that we rely that many of those technologies rely on. So not all of our members will participate under the 2222 participation models, but I think everyone who's interested in 2222, all the different technologies that are eligible, are basically represented in our membership. Um, so I was asked to speak kind of about the market opportunity and how the industry is looking at. Uh, what 2222 means for these resources. Um, as I think Lorenzo and Chris both covered, you know, the, the goal of, of FERC's rule here is to remove barriers to participation for these technologies. Um, FERC found that it was necessary to, to um, uh, issue this order to ensure competition and just and reasonable rates in the markets that it uh, oversees. So, we're, we're fully supportive of that and, and do see this as a huge opportunity. Of course, I have to, before explaining how the industry is looking at the potential of 2222, note that the market opportunity really depends on how the RTOs and ISOs implement Order 2222 and develop their compliance plans, ensuring that that is done in a way that works for DER providers and recognizes all the technical capabilities of DERs. And also, as I think Chris, touched on and, and Lorenzo as well, ensuring that the distribution utility coordination component of this, it's very important, but that that doesn't end up becoming a barrier without good guardrails to make sure that um, that's done in a way that's fair for DERs to ensure that they're able to um, participate. Um, ideally, this should support a range of existing and emergent emerging technologies and business models. For DR providers, it's really that it gives a chance to aggregate smaller sites together into a single resource to earn revenue in the wholesale markets for energy capacity 
and or ancillary services, depending on what the technologies are technically capable of providing, um, which does differ across the different DR technologies. Um, for, for providers, this means an additional revenue stream and new business model opportunities. For DR customers, it means that DERs are more affordable and more available because they have these new revenue streams for services that they're not otherwise able to provide and be compensated for. Um, for all customers of the grid, um, uh, it makes the markets more competitive by enabling these technologies to compete to provide these services that they're, um, that they're able to provide. And then for grid operators, it also provides better visibility into the operation and capability of DERs that are of course um, proliferating across the country. Um, and so that's increasingly important moving forward for, to have that, um, that visibility. Some um, likely use cases that we expect to see, and these I'll just note, I mean, we're already seeing a lot of these technologies participating in the organized wholesale markets, um, what 2222 will do is remove some of the existing barriers and make it easier um, for these resources to aggregate and participate. And in, it, it really varies by market what the existing rules are and where the barriers are. Um, but so behind the meter, solar, residential storage, re residential solar plus storage, electric vehicle charging, both um, residential, uses and also more frequent dispatch like school buses and transit fleets, um, energy efficiency and load curtailment and also front of the meter solar or solar plus storage. So, and these are just kind of the current technologies, of course, as mentioned, it's technology neutral. So it does create opportunities for, um, for additional technologies to participate. And as, as Chris and Lorenzo mentioned, aggregations can be a mix of these technologies. So they can be heterogeneous and not limited to sort of a single um, technology. Um, I don't want to repeat too much of what's what's been said in terms of what's in the rule and what are the key provisions, but I think some of the things that we're looking at as AWE engaging with our members across the different RTOs and ISOs as they're starting to kick off their 2222 compliance processes. Um, some of the things that we're looking for to ensure that this rule actually creates the market opportunity that we think it can create is um, ensuring that these participation models account for the capabilities of heterogeneous aggregations. As mentioned, DERs have different capabilities. Some, some are dispatchable, some are not. Aggregations should allow the full range of DERs to participate to their full potential and enable these heter heterogeneous um, aggregations. Uh, enabling dual participation in both wholesale markets and in retail programs to ensure that you get sort of the full value stack of the DERs. Um, FERC does uh, include a requirement that there not be, that DERs not be doubly compensated. So the same DER can't be paid twice for providing the same service, um, which can include reducing the need to procure a service by a utility or load serving entity. Um, but that should be done in a way that doesn't create sort of sweeping restrictions. Um, let's see. Size requirements uh, will be something that we'll also be looking at as well as locational requirements, how much geographic flexibility uh, that got talked about with sort of the nodal and, um, sorry, I need a glass, <laughs> I need a drink of water. Um, nodal and multinodal um, aggregations, as well as uh, metering and telemetry requirements, which can create, uh, which are obviously important, but can create added costs. Um, and then, sorry, uh, interconnection requirements. These are the responsibility of um, the distribution utility, but um, But what is the what is the independent system operator um, need to know? And then finally, the um, distribution utility role, uh, obviously very important for the distribution utility to have a role. Uh, but what does that look like, and um, how do we ensure that there are some roadblocks to make sure that it's um, it doesn't create barriers for participation? 
Um, so just a few things that we're looking at. Um, these processes are really just kicking off and um, a lot of discussion still to go. All right, thank you to uh, for all the panelists for the introductory uh, remarks, so very informative. We're gonna go now into the Q&A period. So if you have questions that you would like to uh, have the panelists address, you can put them in the Q&A. And we have one from uh, Lynn Kiesling, and she asks, uh, how much do you think this order reduces barriers to local energy markets at the distribution level? So anyone who wants to take a shot at that, can go for it. I'll start since my name is, is on there. Um, so I think it depends. Um, potentially going forward, it ha this order has potential to enable local distribution level markets only because all of the policies, processes, rules, and technology that may need to be invested in to enable order 2222 compliance can then be leveraged to enable local distribution level markets. Um, you know, there's still um, a decent amount of country without AMI. There's still a decent amount of the country without distribution SCADA. And so there's a lot of telemetry and utility investments still needed to be done um, to enable these local distribution level markets. But I think 2222 implementation can definitely get us starting down the pathway towards these local distribution level markets. Uh, additionally, as the distribution utility becomes more comfortable, hopefully with the, with uh, de aggregations, they would then become more comfortable with actually using these resources for distribution needs. Uh, as Caitlin noted, uh, the dual participation uh, question is one of these things outstanding because these resources are fully capable of providing benefits uh, to wholesale markets as well as distribution level markets. And I think we just need to start having some experiences with um, the role of ag aggregated DER in, in any market, frankly, um, before we can get down um, into the level of the distribution level markets. Are there other panelists? Yeah, this is Lorenzo. I would I would just add uh, one point. I, I agree with, with Chris's point. Uh, the order really does not go to distribution level markets explicitly. But there are a couple of things that that sort of can contribute movement in that direction. And I'm thinking particularly of the requirement to allow a distribution utility to override an RTO dispatch. The order says that there needs to be transparent, non-discriminatory mechanism. Um, and so you can envision a situation where, say, two DER aggregations have um, inter overlapping areas where they have individual DERs and a D rate in capacity on distribution could affect more than one DER aggregation, more than one DER provider. So what would be a transparent and non-discriminatory method for allocating a curtailment in capacity? And that sort of raises the question, well, how do you do that on transmission in the transmission grid? It's based on bids, market bids. Um, so what would be an analogous mechanism? And that to me just starts to suggest the ideas of a, a market mechanism that would be transparent and non-discriminatory as a way of allocating D-rates. One thing that I would add sort of more broadly is that I think this is, get, is obviously getting a lot of attention and the utilities will have to be focused on it. And, it creates opportunities for these resources to be earning revenue in wholesale markets. And so out of all of that, there might just be opportunities to, can, to that with regulators and utilities looking at this to, to draw attention and potentially need to make some investments at the distribution level that could sort of more indirectly create some opportunities there. Okay, we have another question that's, uh, once the compliance filings are filed in July, what is the anticipated time frame before the DER aggregators are up and running the various RTOs? 
anyone well, that's really up to each rto to um to specify in their compliance filing that FERC doesn't say what the time should be so and i imagine it'll be different in different areas and, and one thing we saw yeah. with order 841 was that the software upgrades um were one of the drivers of the compliant of the implementation timelines so something to watch for as well but as lorenzo said it'll it'll vary and and i'll just note that that at this point in time i think there's a near 100 percent risk that miso as in one example will ask for an extension of time to solve the compliance filing so i think there's still that question outstanding this any or any other RTO loss for an extension of time. Okay, we have a uh, kind of multi part question that I'll, I'll try and summarize. Uh, so interested in knowing first, who uh, are going to be the ag aggregators? Uh, and then also, there's a, is there any estimate of the amount of new capacity that order 2222 would unlock and then there's a, a third part that is similar to the previous question, but specifically with regard to PJM. If anyone wants to uh, estimate how much new capacity we're talking about here, uh, who are the aggregators likely to be uh, talking about PJM, any or all of those? So, um, as far as who the aggregators may be, uh, I think the answer is going to be yes to all of those potential opportunities, be it uh, entity like um, Sunrun or NL or any number of, sm of smaller uh, software companies that are offering load management services to consumers. Um, you know, we've even, you know, Earlier in the last, earlier this decade, last decade, there were always the thoughts of when waiting for Google and Apple to get in this world as, as aggregators, and certainly they are providing virtual power plant opportunities for their own um, um, centers. So I think the idea is to let whoever can technically meet the requirements of the RTO to go out and figure out if they can aggregate customers and participate directly in the wholesale market. So it could be any number of entities um, who could do this. As for PGM, uh, I don't monitor much about what's going on in PGM. So I, I can't answer, I can't give an estimate on, on the PGM market opportunities. All right. So we have a question about uh, Kaiso. It says, uh, how does order 2222 offer sufficient improvement over the Kaiso precedent to enable greater success, uh, particularly since the California's current DR approach has yet to bear fruit. If not, what more needs to be done to unlock the value of aggregated behind the meter resources? Well, the California situation is, um, I think, informative in the fact that um, Arthur is, is correct, the uh, FERC approved the DERP approach, D, it stands for DER provider, which is essentially the same as the aggregator. It's the entity who performs the aggregation. Um, and so FERC approved that in 2016. It, it was even somewhat of an inspiration for the subsequent NOPER and the order. Um, and since that time, nobody is using it. And what that comes down to, I think, are looking at um, one, what are the alternative opportunities? What, what are the costs with actually trying to do an aggregation under the DERP? And what are the alternatives that a provider of DERs may be able to take advantage of? So in the case of California, a couple of, I, I'll mention three factors that are significant with regard to why it has, it's not being used. One, is that there are two types of interconnection procedures for individual DERs. One is for things that are behind the meter that don't inject power into the grid. That's rule 21, which is a state jurisdictional procedure. The other is for resources that intend to inject power into the grid and participate in the wholesale market. Um, that's the WDAT called wholesale distribution access tariff, which is a FERC jurisdictional tariff. 
it's a lot more costly, a lot more complicated, and it takes a lot more time. So uh, going through a WDAT, that is trying to create an aggregation with injecting resources for wholesale participation, has substantially more in, uh, interconnection challenge and cost associated with it. The second is that the way DERP was created at Kaiso, it did not allow NEM customers to participate. So, and it runs into this double counting idea. If you are uh, uh, under a NEM tariff for behind the meter resources, then you can't be part of a DER aggregation under this rule. And the third thing was that there are no opportunities for these aggregations to get resource adequacy credit. Um, it, California doesn't have a central capacity market like Eastern ISOs do, but there's a capacity requirement which creates a revenue stream based on providing RA capacity. And DER aggregations are not eligible for that at the present time. So um, two things California could do to improve are certainly to address participation by NEM resources and to work with CPUC to develop counting rules to get RA capacity for uh, payments, uh, credit and payments for these resources that I think would help. The difference in interconnection though, I think is still a, a serious concern um, because, uh, and so what's happened is that the would-be providers of DER aggregations instead choose to do behind the meter installations and manage those as, as DR resources, demand response that are just modifying load and not injecting into the grid. It's a simpler path forward. It can get resource adequacy credit. And, and so that's the path they've taken so far. All right, we have another question from Lee Logan. He says, uh, how big of a role do any of the panelists feel this FERC order uh, or the use of DERs more generally will aid efforts to decarbonize the power sector? I wouldn't necessarily have a number to put on this in terms of how big of a role, but I think it's they're important for a couple reasons. One, because many of these resources are low or no carbon. Um, so they're, they're providing services without creating emissions, but then also a lot of them are very flexible. And so they're able to ensure that we're balancing the grid without reliance on more polluting options. Um, so I think they're, if, if we can be successful with implementing order 2222, it is uh, really important. I don't. I, I don't have a number to put on it in terms of how big of a role, but I think it's it is crucial to get this right and get um, uh, to ensure that we're we're not having to rely on, um, you know, for example, peaking gas units. We can rely more on flexible load and distributed resources that are able to respond quickly. I think what I would identify in addition on on this question is that the order changes the conversation about DERs in an important way. What I see in a lot of proceedings, especially I'm following regulatory proceedings in California, is that for the most part, DERs are seen as a problem. You know, all this rooftop solar, how are we gonna forecast it? How are we, what is it gonna affect the duck curve, et cetera? What happens if clouds come over? And so almost everything in regulatory space sees DERs as a problem to be solved and not as a resource that can help accomplish the state goals. And I think that's unfortunate, but that mindset needs to shift. We need to start viewing DERs as a contributor to decarbonization goals, to local resilience, to even equity in the sense that building local resources creates local economic opportunities. And I think order 2222 starts to change that conversation. It says, let's grapple with what are these so-called problems that DERs create and figure out ways to make it work. And it, and it puts a time deadline, you have to file compliance. So I think in that regard, it starts things moving in the right direction. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Jim Lazar. Uh, he asked about a situation where you might have a, an aggregator that controls DERs in multiple service territories 
and uh, could aggregator dispatch storage located in one service ter territory to a nearby ser service territory that had a, whether if there was a price differential or is the storage captive to, to the particular uh, area? I'm not sure what Jim has in mind. Maybe I'm missing the point, but it sounds like a kind of retail or real-time wheeling that we don't really have. The storage resource in Anaheim could sell into the ISO market, um, but it's, we, we don't have a, a rule that says this storage can produce energy in Anaheim, and that energy is explicitly directed to serve load someplace in Edison's territory. That's really not how the wholesale market works. Um, so I'm not quite sure what, um, what Jim is thinking about there. Um, the aggregation, in, in terms of the ISO's geographic restrictions on aggregations, multinodal aggregations are allowed with what they call these sub-lap areas. LAP stands for load aggregation point, and there are like 25 or so zones within the CAISO service territory that are specifically designed such that internal congestion within each of those zones is minimal, so that uh, a multinodal aggregation is not going to cause congestion on the grid because it's minimal in those areas. Um, I imagine that such a zone could include Anaheim as well as part of Edison's territory. But again, it's not really a direct provision by one resource to one to another specific load. Uh, all right, so we have a question for Lorenzo from Cindy Wilson. She says, what penetration th threshold percentages can we expect the need to make noticeable distribution system investments to support the operation of aggregate aggregators in RTO delivery. What specific investments can be expected, and uh, you know how how big of a factor is that likely to represent? Um, I'm I really can't put on a a numerical percentage or threshold. Um, you know, we already see uh, California has 9,000 megawatts of rooftop solar and just the existence of those creates needs for greater visibility and greater forecasting capability. So um, I think it, it doesn't take uh, from where California is. I think we're at the point right now where we need to think about upgrading the distribution utilities capabilities. And I think that will center around things like real-time situational awareness as well as mechanisms for the distribution utility to inform a DER aggregator when there's a change in distribution conditions that may impact their ability to respond to a dispatch instruction. So I would say those kinds of things, visibility capabilities and communications between the, the, the key parties. Um, we need to start developing them now in areas where there is a significant growth of DERs. All right, the I'll add to what Lorenzo said is, um, we know, at least I know, I believe, that DERs are, are coming and they're gonna become an increasing part of, of the electric system. And there's a number of initiatives going on in the country at the state level looking at distribution system planning. Um, that's also part of the New York DER rate design and compensation manual. And what this question puts upon states is to start looking at their distribution system plans and operations <clears throat> in advance of that tipping point of DER. So whether it's driven by storage or EVs or rooftop solar or community solar, uh, at some point, the states are going to have to start looking more specifically, more deeply into the utility distribution system plans so they can plot out those investments uh, that Lorenzo pointed that, that are needed for the distribution system in a more logical manner. Because if we wait until 9,000 megawatts of rooftop solar come onto a system, um, then it's going to be too late for the distribution system and it's going to be incredibly more costly at that point in time. So uh, we had one question asking whether a nonprofit aggregator 
uh, say for a municipality would be possible. Oh, uh, sure. That's even structure. possible in an IOU service territory. The, the order explicitly says they have no restrictions on business models for DER aggregators. So they could certainly choose a nonprofit model if they wanted to. Okay. And uh, so we are, if you were KISO, what would you advise MISO to do to reduce uh, the time aggregator DERs have to sit in the generation interconnection queue for capacity rights and transmission access? I guess one, one clarification I would make, at least this is true in CAISO area, is that the aggregation does not go through the interconnection process. Each of the individual DERs goes through an interconnection process. And when an aggregator wants to form an aggregation, it's basically assumed and needs to be stipulated and verified that each of the component DERs has gone through an interconnection process. What the aggregation then does is it goes through what we call a registration, which informs both the distribution utility and the ISO that the aggregator is forming this resources based on this list of whatever, 25 or 2,500 individual DERs. But the interconnection queue process is really for the individual DERs. Now, um, I, I think, uh, I don't know if it's, it's the same way in, in MISO, but I imagine um, that's one thing to consider. And I, I guess an effect that we can, that may be replicated that I would advise Rao to, to look out for is how the interconnection requirements or the study processes change depending on whether a resource is behind the meter and non-injecting, just modifying load versus wanting to inject into the grid, either from behind the meter or from in front of the meter. That typically, it's the latter case that really triggers the more extensive uh, interconnection study process. So I would look at what are the opportunities for a fast track kind of uh, interconnection process for uh, injecting resources. Okay, we have, a, we have a question from uh, David Little. Uh, it's, it's a little long, I'm not able to summarize it, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, so whether BTM or FTM, the restrictions on ability to use a resource for other purposes, uh, multi, multiple use cases, will be, a, will be key to commercial viability, uh, question mark. Uh, the detail on whether being available for 10 to 20 hours of demand reduction generation in uh, the energy reliability markets is different than say a requirement to be available 100% of the time for load reduction generation. Uh, do you have a sense that the RTO ISO rules will get into this? Well, um, at the end of the order, um, it uh, explicitly leaves as out of scope questions about distribution grid services and what other kinds of services a DER aggregation may provide other than wholesale market participation for energy ancillary services and capacity. So um, I don't think there's anything in the compliance requirements that will require uh, an ISO or RTO to address those kinds of questions. To answer the first question, yes, we, we see that as very important, enabling participation in multiple um, value, providing multiple value streams. Um, I know that one, it's something that we'll be looking at as the RTOs and ISOs are putting together their plans to make sure that these participation models aren't creating barriers and are enabling, for example, um, resources to be able to update their offers, um, to be able to self-schedule to allow them to reflect participation in um, in retail programs, for example. So it's definitely something that that we've seen in existing participation models as a challenge and something that that we'll be looking for. 
Okay, final question to the panel. Do the panelists have any thoughts on how the MOPR might be applied to heterogeneous DER aggregations? I'm going to sidestep the question entirely and offer that uh, there, I'm hoping that MOPR will be done away with in the next year or two with the new FERC. All right. Uh, and we have, uh, if you are interested in learning more about this, uh, including uh, we've written extensively on uh, MOPR and other related issues at R Street. Uh, so you can go to rstreet.org. Uh, this uh, webinar will be available on our website. We're recording it. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for a uh, engaging and informative discussion. And I would like to thank also all of you, our viewers, uh, for uh, asking really great uh, questions. So thank you, everybody. Uh, it's the end. <laughs>